Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. I'm Alex, and we've got a number of people in the room, including <laughs> Olga and Eric and, and Terry, as, as we often do. And um, tonight we're rejoined by Josh Smith, who hasn't been around for a while, but uh, luckily he's he's come back. He's going to ready to do a show for us in the not too distant future. So um, it's good to have Josh back with us. And of course, um, Lloyd Smith is here. Uh, he's going to be coming in from Deep Sky West, and he's going to tell us a lot about Deep Sky West. And that's the main focus of our program today. I'm going to share my screen here in a minute. Boink. Share my screen and sharing my full screen. And when I do that, you should see. Um, well, of course, you should see me because uh, with a little bit of a time delay, I expect. And um, down in the lower right hand corner of the screen, you can see the Rumble Talk. We've now got seven people joining us to, to, on Rumble Talk and nobody's making any comments over here, which is perfectly fine. That's actually the way we, way we kind of are working towards the <laughs> Um, there's a better place to make comments, and that's on YouTube channel itself. So if you want to go to YouTube, there's a good place to make comments over there. So I encourage you to do that. Um, but there's some other things I want to show you while I'm here. One is our upcoming shows. And you can click on the upcoming shows link. And um, you can see Lloyd's going to be here today. Next week, one of the session managers is coming in. Um, Nina, uh, I nighttime imaging and astronomy. It's a session manager, kind of like SGP or PRISM or a few other ones we've talked about over time. And uh, that's going to be pretty cool to hear. It's open source, kind of like PhD2 guiding. So that, that should be interesting to see how they've, uh, their interpretation of how to do a session manager. And it's a free program, so you might want to see that. Greg Crinklaw is finally, finally, we hope, coming in. He's been rescheduled several times, Sky Tools next week. And then um, on Sunday, November 3rd, I think it is. Yeah, it's November 3rd. Ann Zabladoff will be coming in. Um, she's going to be telling us about how we can become Sciences again. Scientists, we've had several of those programs lately, and I think they're always interesting. Um, Greg Beneke brings us uh, up to, he's going to tell us one of those stories about how to become an astroinger, some of the mistakes he's made along the way, and uh, equipment choices and stuff like that. So I think we'll enjoy that. Then we're going to take that, that uh, week off because we'll all be at the Astro uh, Advanced Imaging uh, Conference. And um, then we'll come back with some other things we've got. We're trying to fill up the schedule again, and we look like we're doing a good job. Tolga's doing a lot of work in that area, and thank him a lot for that. Um, the um, Well, anyway, uh, Lloyd is going to tell us today uh, about um, uh, Deep Sky West, and we'll be getting to him in a minute. But there is an announcement that I need to make um, about RTMC. If you guys know that I've been going to RTMC for like 25 years, and uh, I've been an Merit Award. Oh, this domain is for sale. Boy, they did that quickly. Uh, RTMC. Uh, oh, astronomyexpo.com. Mm -hmm. Expo.org. And uh, that's a sad and heartfelt farewell to everybody. RTMC is uh, folding its doors. They've, um, the camp is, um, can't really accommodate us anymore for a number of reasons. The board has made a very sad decision that after 51 years, I think it is, or something like that, they've had to close shop. So we'll be missing that. Um, see that picture in the background there? That's one of mine. That's my horsey back there. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been a part of RTMC for a long time. I mean, all my real hobby life, um, I got a merit award for telescope building, and um, I presented Beginner's Corner in the imaging workshop up there. And I go up there, and I'm also the guy in charge of traffic up there. So when you first get there, you can't get in because of me and stuff like that. So it's been a big part of my life, and I'm going to miss it. And, um, you know, that's not good that it's happened, but I wanted to make sure everybody knew about that nightfall. Nightfallstarparty.com is another thing I wanted to tell you a little bit about. I've told you about it before, and you've seen shows here on the Astro Imaging Channel about Nightfall, uh, the, the imaging rigs of Nightfall, where we show what people brought to Nightfall. Mm -hmm. the they take. 
And uh, we're going to be back again in probably just a couple of weeks, October 24th through the 27th. And uh, if anybody doesn't know about it, we've got a lot of cool things happening. Um, the most important thing for imagers, of course, is that our beloved Richard Wright will be there. And Richard's going to tell us about best practices in astrophotography. And you can go to nightfallstarparty.com workshops. But there's a whole lot of other things happening at Nightfall. And um, here's a schedule you can find. And there's lots of presentations. I'm going to be doing a presentation about five astro images that destroyed the world. And it's, um, I like the presentation. So come, come see it. OK, anyway. Um, those are my formal announcements, and I'm going to get back to uh, introducing now um, uh, Lloyd Smith, who's coming to us from New Mexico. And Lloyd, are you ready to take over? I am. Okay, you got it. All right. How do I switch over to my screen? Uh, Tolko will take care of that. Okay, good. Well, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I know a lot of you folks uh, that I see on the channel all the time, but... Hopefully we have a lot of other interested parties out there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Deep Sky West. You guys know um, we did this, what, about uh, maybe three years ago now? Maybe a little bit, a little bit, uh, not quite as long as that. So I'm going to start there and kind of uh, do an evolution, kind of what has happened to us since then. Things we've learned, things we're thinking about doing, and kind of how, you know, we've evolved because uh, the hobbies change and we've changed and it's uh, it's been a pretty interesting time. So um, if any time anyone has any questions, you know, just just stop. This is a little bit free flowing, but I'm going to take you through at least the the evolution and then we'll get to a, an interesting uh, turning point here. So let's let's go to the first page. Um, how do I get that happening? Um, oh, we haven't shown you how to, to uh, share your screen yet. Uh, we talked about it. That was okay. a long time ago. Um, well, and besides the software has changed. So what you need to do is, is put your cursor up in the upper right hand corner of your yep. Hangout screen. Yep. And see where it says share screen. Yep. OK. And then the, you'll see your screen there and click on that mm -hmm. screen. Mm -hmm. And then the share down in the lower right hand corner will wake up. Yep. Good deal. Share and off you go. All right. So you guys are with me now. Yeah. Uh, I don't see you. Oh, yeah, because you're you're showing me because you happen to be seeing me. And then in the set, there we go. You're on. Right. You're good. All right, good. So um, th this is uh, this is actually the first few pages of this have not changed since the last time we 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 talked. And uh, there's a reason for that. But um, it's actually interesting to look at this this particular scene. I shot this panorama from nearby the house that's. Uh, where the residents live on the property at, at Deep Sky West. So it's it's dated and pretty interesting. But at the time, uh, when we talked about this before, and when we even built the facility, you know, we were thinking, you know, what's what's the most fantastic situation you could have? And none of these things have changed, right? You want great seeing, you want the best that you can get. Uh, you, you know, you want, a, you want reliability in your infrastructure, redundancy, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the mindset that we had then. And so, you know, we, we assessed the market and, and the equipment and the various vendors and said, yeah, you know, um, the technology is there. And this is us talking back in August 2015. And uh, but then this was the problem. Right. Most of us face this. Um, I actually live in Atlanta, which is where I am right now. And uh, I image from my backyard kind of down here. And, you know, where Atlanta is, where all that red stuff is. And so it got to be, you know, once I. Um, got the basics and really wanted to get serious, but I wasn't in a good place to do it. So, um, you know, we started eyeballing around the country, especially those dark areas that, you know, the country's almost divided right in half. So we, uh, this is where we ended up. Um, let me go back and see if I can get this little animation to go. So we have a 35 acre site in Rowe, New Mexico. It's at uh, approximately 7,400, 7,200 feet uh, in the middle of nowhere. And if you notice in this chart, there's a, a rectangle kind of left of center. That's the residence. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's an earth berm house kind of totally off the grid. It's really kind of cool. My partner, Bruce Wright, this is his thing. He's interested in uh, efficient off-grid housing. Uh, he has 
you know, very little interest in this guy, believe it or not. I'm the one that pressed that issue. And uh, when he opened the house, we were standing on the roof on New Year's Eve, a glass of champagne. I'm looking at the sky and they're worried about drinking their champagne. I'm thinking this place is unbelievable. And that's where we built. So a um, couple of things have happened. Uh, here's, there's, there's really two distinct things that happen uh, at Deep Sky West, all under the same roof. Uh, on the one hand, you have uh, traditional hosting. Um, that's kind of in the last bullet here. You know, even today we have uh, individuals who just a single person running their system, their father son teams. There are teams of uh, strangers that are that are friends now. Uh, commercial operations host with us uh, to do all all manner of things, academic institutionals, professional professional and amateur astronomers. And of course, me, you know, and, and many of you, I just take pretty pictures. I don't do anything to the meaningful contribution. <laughs> I make no meaningful contributions to science, really. Uh, lots of other people do who host with us. And, and what that means for us, it's not any mystery. They, um, they bring their system. We help them get it in, in place. We make sure it's safe. If it's clear, we open the roof. If it's not, we don't. And we um, you know, tend to you know, basic needs, which is most of what occurs, a cable problem or, or what have you. Um, another thing we did, and many of you are familiar with this, is our subscription model. It was, this was a, a little bit different, a little bit different thought process. And, and the idea was, was really this, that there are not going to be a whole, not everyone's going to be able to host their system in a remote site. So if that's, if that's the only um, barrier, then how can we solve for it? And we've gotten pretty good at image acquisition. And to the extent that people can't, don't know how to, don't have time to, haven't yet mastered it, they're working their way up the various learning curves that exist in this hobby, our subscription model flattens the acquisition curve. It doesn't say you shouldn't learn how to do it, that's up to you. Um, but what it does is gives you the ability to take some variables and make them constant. And I think about it like that. You know, when I'm sitting, when I'm first sitting in my backyard with all this equipment, I didn't know the difference between a plate solve and a focuser. And you know, I'm collecting data, I'm making images, and they're terrible. I don't know if it's me or if it's my data. It's probably both. Our subscription model flattens that one variable. It is not the data. You know, 99% of the time, it is not the data. Um, so that's what that model is about. Two things happening simultaneously under the same roof. Um, there's a table on the page there with a bunch of our systems, well, all of our systems that we have in place. Um, we change these out from time to time. Um, so, for example, we're bringing on another, um, we're bringing on a 17 in New Mexico right now, and uh, we're bringing another one online in Chile early in next year. And we're actually sticking a Newtonian in at, um, at Deep Sky West in New Mexico, just because we haven't had one before. It's probably one of the few optical design, designs that we haven't used or put on offer. Then there's a couple of things we're just thinking about. and. Tolga and the others who uh, suffer through long phone calls with me know I'm always thinking of something wild. These are just a couple of things, not so wild. Um, the second of these two, the super wide fill system in Chile, we're going to do that. We've done it in New Mexico. We'll do it there too. It will be uh, a different system, but similarly a uh, super wide field. And the skies down there are rich for those types of targets. And we're thinking about doing something with solar. You know, I, I, all day long goes by and hardly anything gets done in the sky. So it didn't make sense to me to let the day go by without doing something meaningful. So we're, we're figuring out a way to um, do something during the day as well. So um, another part of the evolution that's, uh, oops, I jumped too far ahead, that's worth talking about. And um, um, let, me, uh, let me jump ahead to a couple of pictures here is, uh, this is this is how things looked from the sky in my, um, my drone that I've broke soon after this shot. Um, and today to the to the right of the uh, lone observatory is where the second one of our facilities now stands. And I'll show you some pictures of it. So this is um, Deep Sky West Alpha, the original one, very, uh, very uh, creatively named. Actually, the one in the upper left corner, the one that's really artificially bright white, that one is the original incarnation of the observatory, and there were nine systems inside. 
And so it's modular. And if you look in the picture in the lower left, you know, approximately the third row back, we just added that part on later, about a year and a half into our, our, our fun. And uh, there's a couple other shots. The two on the right are of it in its uh, enhanced length, I'll call it. On the upper left, you can kind of see uh, alpha in the open position and beta over the horizon. You'll notice it's designed a little bit differently, but the footprint is pretty much the same. It's a, it's a fairly rigid grid, six rows deep, three rows across. Each system in there has uh, ample space to go around. On the right-hand side in the foreground is a 20-inch plane wave that recently went in. You can see a few L mounts that are becoming uh, quite popular. So our, as I mentioned, our original capacity really was one until people started bugging us about building more space. So we, we created nine, we expanded that to 18, we added 18 more. And we actually have some flexibility in the floor plan for capacity up to as many as 50, depending on what they are. So that's kind of how we've, we've, uh, we've changed and, and we've added, oops, let me go back. We added um, another system in Chile that's been online since um, July. It's again a subscription system. The question again is the same. If you can't be in Chile with your own stuff, that's the only thing stopping you. How do we solve for that? And uh, so far this has been our answer and it's been working pretty well. It's been on the ground since uh, July and uh, quite, quite productive through their winter. Um, so I'm gonna back up a little bit. Some of the, I, I threw in a couple of um, shots uh, that come off of these various, all of these come off of some deep sky west system somewhere. Just some of and these are just mine. Our subscribers are numbering um, over, since our, since our inception, our subscriber base numbers in the hundreds. And so there's um, images with these data all over the place. Uh, these happen to be just a couple that I pulled out. Upper left comes off the RC optical, lower left off the Rokin on. It's, uh, I think, nine or 12 panels. I'll never do that again. And so on. Um, another couple of, uh, I'm not sure these galaxies all got lined up, but there is an RH305 upper right. The one in the center is off of the refractor down in Chile. And the lower right is actually off of my own system, uh, an FSQ with 16.2. Um, not sure why that's in there, but that's that's really what we're about, all on one page. And um, I'm curious to, if anyone has questions, and I'm actually really curious about what you think about what we're thinking about. Hi, Lloyd. Uh, this is Eric. What kind Hi. of ideas do you have for solar, since obviously <laughs> the roof would have to be open? Well, um, First thought was just, I'm sick of watching days go by, and I never did a lot of solar. The last meaningful solar picture I took was on Christmas Day, and I think 1999, there was a partial solar eclipse that day. Um, might have been 2000. So um, we're thinking about, you know, the finest refractor that we can find with the uh, finest filter set that we can find. And we have two domes available. One will be installed on the site permanently for... Our technician has a plane wave 17 and an L500. His dome and scope will park there, you know, forever, hopefully. And this one beside it. So it'll be another dome, Eric. Little dome with a scope in it. We'll figure out how to make it work, but it seems like there should be something useful there. Some things we do don't work. If it doesn't work, that's fine. Uh, I can have a lot of fun with it. Yeah, it's a little bit tricky to do solar since it's video capture takes huge amounts of data and it almost has to be hands-on to do it correctly. That is an operator at the controls. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, we're, again, things we're thinking about, there's a lot longer list, uh, anything from ideas that are mild to wild. I will tell you the general things we think about when we do anything is who's doing it now and how are they doing it and what would we change? And if they're not doing it, then, you know, that's even better. Um, some things, you know, hosting is hosting. Everyone does it. You pick your price point, your service level, your location, and off you go. Um, there's not a ton of create creativity there. Um, but on the things that surround the hobby, like, you know, we think a lot about learning and education around imaging. We 
we essentially sell data. The more you use, the better it is for us, right? Um, if we give you too much and you can't consume it, then you are no longer a part of our service. That happens, believe it or not. I've been told that a half a dozen times this year. Um, so a couple other wilder ideas, um, and none, none ready for prime time, but these two are, are pretty interesting to us right now. Anything else? There's a well, question. There was, there was no question. Uh, George, um, can I come up with this now? Um, let me let me stop okay. there. You think? Yeah. Someone asked. Uh, George Lynn said, "Where can we find pricing?" Um, pricing is on our website, uh, www.deepskywest.com. Or you can always email me. My phone number uh, is there, right here. I'm, I'm evidently a man without a time zone because this rings uh, every hour of every day. <laughs> There's another question. Are you going to, say, sell uh, home sites so people could build uh, houses and do a little, you know, have, what do they call an astro village or something of that yeah. nature? No, no, that's, no, we are not going to do that unequivocally. Um, that's That's a whole different situation that's for us that's a different business model that we we don't want to be in we have lots of land and lots of land available but uh that's been done it's being done it's been tried and failed it's been tried and successful and i think we'll let them keep doing that um but, but the issue with us is i think that's i could see myself one day as a retiree having all my stuff right at my house um but the way i think about it is if you know if i if i have a ferrari i'm not going to drive it on a dirt road unless I just have to, and that would be a horrible waste. And, and likewise, uh, we're not tending toward this sort of village idea because um, we're actually trying to move away from physical infrastructure, not towards it. So th there was a question uh, last time. I did a, when I was there, I did a small little presentation yeah. uh, of Deep Sky West. I showed them around and there was a couple of questions uh, which one one was price, which you just answered now. The second was uh, accommodations. Yeah. Uh, where, where do you stay when you, like, if I want to come over there and set up my system, where do I stay? Yeah. Uh, do you have any restrictions of, does it have to be done on full moon or half moon or right. uh, thing, questions like that? And my second question is, that's a personal question from me to you, is, <laughs> well, since... Since you have so much experience with remote setups, can you give us some like your top three picks on what's most like your top three advice? Yeah. If somebody wants to go remote, what would be like the best thing you would? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if I, I'll have you might have to remind me of one of these three questions. So one was about accommodations. Um, there are three three choices. You know, we are. 45 minutes or so from Santa Fe. Um, it's a regular city, lots of choices there. Uh, there's a bed and breakfast that we started up a relationship with recently. I have not personally stayed there. I don't go to the site that often. Uh, Tolga's there more than I am, uh, by fivefold more than I am. Um, but there's a relationship with this bed and breakfast that's actually pretty good. And uh, until recently, a lot of our folks stayed at the residence, uh, but, um, you know, my business partner, his family lived there full time. Uh, so it's not nearly as convenient. Uh, in terms of, uh, so what the other question told her was about um, best practices. Yeah, just, yeah. you know, you run what, yeah. six, seven systems every night? Oh yeah, um, actually nine. Right, so. Nine. Yeah, I, I yeah, mean, so. like I did in my backyard, but it's times nine now. And so they need to work well and not be a pain. I don't need to have to mess around with them a whole lot. There's more than me that can touch them and mess around with it, but I'm usually the main driver. And, but if you're hosting a system, we, we host a lot. We have capacity for 42. We have, I don't know, 36 on the ground now, and that will be 42 before the year's out. Cause they're all but a few spots are accounted for. But um, here's a couple of things that come up. Um, controversial for some through the mount cabling, you have send your, system off you have a complex cable plant through the mount 
very neat, pretty, perfectly. They're all black cables. That is an awful system for us to support. You know, the black cable is broken. Okay. There's a hundred of them and they're all bound up with zip ties and they're down in beautiful plastic sheathing and it looks nice, but it is, is, is difficult to service. So I recommend some simple things, color coded cables, uh, cables of the appropriate length. It's nice to, it's okay to coil them up and, and get them out of the way if they're, if they're too long, but appropriate lengths is better. Color coded is better if they're not different colors. Color the end with different kinds of tape. Do something to make them identifiable on both ends. Uh, through the mount, I mentioned that up front. I didn't say much more about it. Some mounts physically, it's just not good for them. And you guys know some of the, how the internals of certain mounts look. Some of them are bare, smooth metal. No problem through the mount, long-term wear and tear maintenance. Those that actually interact with the innards of the system, and there are a few like that, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, that does cause a problem over time. Um, other things I think are, you have to think about is uh, remote access. Uh, lots of us know about TeamViewer and other similarly designed systems, but if you have remote access, have at least two ways to get in your system. And, and at least uh, use systems that, whose access uh, methods are different. Because TeamViewer goes down all the time, you know, multiple times a day. Uh, if hey, Lloyd, quick, quick question yeah. about Team Viewer. Yeah, I don't know if you followed on the forums. It seems like they're starting to ban a lot of personal, or they're they're calling people out and saying they're using them as commercial licenses yeah. when they're really using them personally. Um, do you yeah. have uh, recommendations beyond that? Since it seems like I, I personally know at least four or five people that's happened to in the last couple months now. Yeah, um, I've talked to them about it. So my solution is just to leave them. That's my our our decision is to not to renew our commercial licenses with them. It's just painful. Even for us, where we have multiple licenses, uh, it's a little bit cost prohibitive, uh, especially when there's free solutions that are ubiquitous. So right. we're just writing it out um, and we'll let them sort. When I had an illegal license for, you know, when I was a single person, it would get mad at me. When I used it for a couple of months when we first got started, no, illegally for the world, um, they were mad at me then. Then they got unmad like they didn't care. Well, I paid the money and it's got worse. So, yeah, we're done. It's three years and we're done. Do you it's have one that, that you recommend or you're going towards? I'm going to use Chrome, which has always been my backup. Chrome remote okay. desktop. It works. Uh, even in the new incarnation, it took me a minute to get used to. But on my screen now, I have, you know, 18 tabs. Each one of them is one of the nine systems. I'm watching one focus. I'm looking at the seeing monitor who just lost its star. And so on. So yeah, it's um, the problem. Yeah, it seems snappy. The problem I agree. Is what is going to be the backup to the to the backup is taking the first position. What's going to now take second position? Because it's not going to be Team Viewer from not. Right. Okay. You know, I can put another vote in for Chrome Remote. It is yeah. behaving flawlessly for a month and a half after Team Viewer decided that I was mm -hmm. a commodity and kicked me off. And it seems Are that. In, in our shop, Eric, it seems like in our shop, because we are licensed, some users got hit, you know, because of it. You know, it's kind of like their their systems aren't smart enough to let, you know, personal well, I, commercial I, users I come in. It's a way to generate revenue. They figure if they kick 100 people off, maybe they get 10 new customers. Yeah, probably. So there's another question here. Uh, can you explore, uh, John Adastra? wants an explanation of how the targeting is selected amongst the teams? Yeah. Yeah, great question. It's a common question. So uh, we keep it fairly simple. Say there's a team of, of N people. Um, what we have found is uh, when someone first joins, there's a barrage of requests, and then it dies off. It doesn't really matter to us the volume, because the sky dictates what you shoot more than anything else. It's very seasonal. You guys know the patterns. You guys with uh, short focal length scopes definitely know when galaxy season starts in the northern hemisphere and so on. So you make your request. There's a sheet that's you know accessible to everyone on the team. They make the request. We sort it, get rid of duplicates and all that sort of uh, data cleansing. And um, we first look at first come, first serve and see if that makes sense against the sky. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, we have a preferential... Um, we have a bias towards 
wideband, meaning we will shoot it um, up until we no longer can. You know, kind of narrow band is a little bit of a, it's a filler in terms of the way we think about it and in terms of the way people select targets. Um, HALRGB is very common. You know, we still get a lot of uh, narrow band requests. So you make your selection, we sort it, clean it, add it to the schedule. You have a status report that shows what we're shooting, when we last shot it, how many frames uh, we've shot, the duration thereof. And eventually we'll call it complete, which, which may actually lead to another question in anticipation of how do you know when it's done. Um, as I said earlier, we wanna make sure the data is not the question. So we shoot long, you know, kind of a typical standard, uh, a typical standard on a say kind of F5 systems do really well at 600 or 900 second exposures. We will shoot four to five hours per channel, always unbend. We don't do any bending of anything unless the scope configuration dictates it. We don't do it to save time or anything like that. Make sense? Eric, did you get that? Uh, yeah, I got that. I, I have another question. Do you ever, I would imagine the temptation is to go after, you know, the top 100. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. It's a, do you ever go after, you know, the, the really difficult targets that are difficult for capture and for processing for to a real, I mean, a challenge for the processor? Yeah. Or is that kind of counter to the team concept? No, actually, it isn't. A couple of things that will help clear that. So yeah, there's there's targets, there's data that I ha you know I have all the data for everything. I don't process it all. No one really could. But there are targets that I've tried. I'm on my fourth and fifth year trying to get them right, and I'm probably never going to. So yeah, we shoot what the team asks to shoot. What we what we how we alter it, other than the ways I talked about, is we don't shoot the same thing in consecutive years. We're not going to shoot LRGB M42 this year, next year, next year, next year. So suppose you pick a team that just, and that scope really just shot that in the last 12 months and you really want it. Um, there's no great way around that. So, you know, it's not a lot of times that that happens, but you know, I make those calls. We've got a guy or gal who wants the day. I just give it to him. It's not that, um, it's not that big a deal, but we don't want to take everyone through another year of the same darn thing. We'll shoot them every other year. And we could recycle data, but that's not the deal that we've made with everybody. We're shooting it contemporaneously. And then from time to time, there'll be a target that's very interesting. And we may have, you know, 80 or 100 hours on it or 50 or 60. And we'll say, hey, guess what? We're going to lump that all together, have at it, and see what you can do. Lloyd, can, yes, can, can, can somebody go back? and get archive data? Do you keep the, you know, like you've been doing this for so many years? Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we do have lots of data. I mean, data that we've kept, meaning, you know, we have pretty good, uh, we have pretty good hit rate. We don't have a lot of, a lot of throwaway data, but we do throw away bad frames. If it's bad, we throw it out, we reshoot it. We try to catch them all because we look at a hundred percent of all frames. Uh, we do a, what I call a, a daily relative comparison of all data. And then we do a spot absolute comparison within a data set once it's complete. But um, so your point really is, do we sell data that we shot before? We have on occasion, certain people ask for it here and there. Uh, it's not been our business to sell the data just as is. Okay, <clears throat> okay but if, if I'm a current user, that is that I'm, I'm signed on subscribing and stuff like that, yeah. and, and I decide I wanna, go back into the past and you've shot this thing three times already and mm -hmm. I don't need it shot again, but can mm -hmm. I, I'd like to process it. If I'm a current subscriber, can I do that? Well, um, from time to time. So okay. if you're going to, so if you, if we were going to be in business for 10 years and sell or close it, you could join in year 10 and get all 10 years. You see, so that doesn't quite work out, but if there's an interesting target a one, like I said, where we have a ton of data, or someone says, you know, I really would like to combine that up. on a case by case basis. We dig it out and hand it over. Yeah. I do it myself too. I tried to take Astro Pixel Prospector. I read something about it. I didn't do a whole lot of research or study, but I just loaded it down with like four years worth of uh, 
the same target off of 18 different systems. Uh, <laughs> didn't work out, but um, you know, there's cases like that where I'd love to uh, see what people can do. Uh, yeah. I haven't always been able but, to. But that's off. not the business you guys are in. No, no, not yeah. really. Okay, cool. And, and you know, selling the data, people have tried it and done it and been successful at it. In my view, um, there's a contemporaneous aspect of it that makes it maybe a little bit more valuable. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, yeah, I, I just think, I think a data sale is something that maybe we would do down the road. You well, know, one can always go back to the Hubble archive and download that stuff if they need something right. to process, yeah, right? Exactly. Okay. I think right now of all the stuff that we've kept, we keep probably 85% of the data. We have, I don't know, seven terabytes of finished data. Um, and basically unlimited capacity. We, we run our own cloud. We used to use Google Drive as a transfer media, uh, but their filters misidentified our bias files as being uh, videos, copyright videos. So we bailed on, yeah. I, I know the VP of Google Cloud Services. I need to talk to the guy. So this is ridiculous. So we bailed and built our own cloud. So. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So. Lloyd, how do you sort your data? In other words, what is a good frame for you? Yeah. And, uh, and it's not just, is there a, I mean, is there a criteria for every single scope? Uh, do you put the so-so data with the really good data and let, leave it up <laughs> to you to figure out? Or do you, you know, color yeah. it? Yourself? Well, what I described before is, is a process that we use. There's one, two, there's three people here who, with the ability to review the data. Um, I, I do most of it, uh, but three people can do it. And as I described, it's a relative comparison. So it's a visual relative comparison. So I'm looking at all the data that came that night. What is the best of that night? And then there's a, an absolute comparison where you're looking at what's the goodness across the data set. Because you know, it might have one night that looked great, but relative to another night that was excellent, you know, you might have a bunch of data to throw out. So when we find those cases, we'll, we may have even said, this is a wonderfully done, complete data set. And we say, oops, I just found some bad frames. We pull it off the line, reshoot, add them back, and call it good. So there's not a sense of, ah, we'll just mix in some good stuff and some bad stuff. It's uh, We're trying not to deliver anything that is clearly and obviously messed up, um, out of focus, streak, trail, cloud effect, moon effected. Those are the things we look for. Now we could push everything through a subframe selector. And then at that point, you have to decide really what your yield is. And honestly, um, like it or not, I guess some people will agree or disagree. Um, and I've done these experiments um, myself. So when I reject data, it's usually out of focus, trailed, something's wrong. When I process our data, I use that data, a lot of it, if it's any good. And we'll see what the rejection algorithms can do with it. So the point I'm subtly making is I think that we have, for example, I've observed folks with systems that image at two arc seconds per pixel, and they're expecting sub-second resolution, and they're throwing away half of their data. And, you know, part of, part of, um, what I've done when I've done these experiments is to prove the point that uh, <clears throat> you can drive SNR and not ruin your image, even if your data is not absolutely perfect. And I think people agonize over single frames at a time coming out of the system. That is not what you're going to look at when your image is done. You're going to look at a combined image. So look at that. Anyway, that's a philosophical thing, not so much a business practice thing. From a business practice perspective, we find the bad data, we kill it and, and fix it. Cool. Yeah. So it's been fun, guys. Uh, I would tell you, for example, I mean, look, I'm gonna flip over to uh, I'm gonna flip over to our FSQ 106, the very first system we put on the ground. Uh, is actually uh, doesn't even belong to us, and still doesn't, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, it, it did its first image, LDN 1250, in August 2015. And um, in that time, we've, we've marked as complete, but attempted more than 140 images, averaging um, about 17 hours uh, across the board. 
Longest one is probably about 50 hours. The shortest one is probably three, some cluster or something unusual like that. So we shoot every clear night and we keep a fairly high standard. And, uh, you know. Lloyd, are you, are you trying to show us something? I am not. I was looking through the oh, okay. so, I could quote, so I could look at the numbers. I, I you know, each system has one. Like the Pelwe, for example, that just went up in July. Since July, we've completed 10 targets. Average integration time over those 10 is 25 and a half hours. Uh, the longest integration we've done is 54 hours. I know it's a little excessive, but I we like it. <laughs> And, you know, we've got some shorties out there. Just it depends on the nature. There's lots of HDR targets, so we will shoot appropriately. Take, for example, um, NGC 2070. You guys know that Tarantula Nebula. We shot subs on that at 120s, 60s, 300s, and hell, uh, 600s and 1800s. And we shot LRGBSHO across the board. I think a few people, I've seen a couple of renditions on Astro Bin, but... Um, I didn't, I didn't put mine up, at least not yet. It's one of those I can't get quite right, and I agonize over it. Well, that's the story. Um, our plans uh, going forward, you know, we, we built our second structure. We decided when we got to only two spots left in Alpha, we would build Beta. So we did that, and when we opened Beta, it was sold more than 50% and now it's, you know, almost done. And so we're running up against that. Do we do this again? Um, um, so that's, uh, that's undecided if we're going to expand again in that capacity. We'll, we'll, when we get down to only two, we'll make that same choice again. Because time on task to build one of these is not, not very long. They are quite massive, but uh, they're fairly simple. Eric, you see that other question? Yeah, I was just getting to it. Uh, okay. John asked, do you shoot, oh, what's your limit on declination? 30 degrees, 25 degrees, 35? Um, we are not, we are not um, physically limited. In, in most cases, we can see right down to the ground. But um, we... Um, as a matter of course, you know, we shoot what I think is appropriate appropriately. You know, for example, we schedule um, we schedule our shots so that, um, you know, maybe red and HA may shoot low, uh, depending on the target and what its travel is going to be through the sky. We might pick it up at at 30 degrees if we have to 25, even if we need to. But generally, you know, we're going to schedule luminous to happen above 45, uh, blue above 40, 45, and everything in between. So we dictate that where they get shot altitude-wise. But uh, from a physical infrastructure point of view, we can go down lower than you need to. And I imagine you have the same kind of requirements for where the moon is on RGB and LRGB. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we shoot... Um, we shoot in a fashion that uh, we're aware of, you know, moon size, moon distance, filters. Uh, so, for example, for most systems, say, uh, kind of F5 and up, generally, you know, you can shoot HA within 40 degrees of a full moon sometimes. Depends. But you can get pretty close. Um, O3, you need to be about 90 degrees away. Uh, we shoot luminance in the presence of the moon. Uh, I think some people drive their systems to not do that. Um, but kind of a basic standard, if you can be 120 degrees away, you should not have any moon effect. But that's our going in standard 12014, which is pretty standard and scheduler, which drives some of our systems. Some of our systems are underlying them is scheduler. There's at least one autopilot system. Um, and uh, a few prism systems. They all are slightly, and we're familiar with a lot of them, SGP, CCDC, they all have their pros and cons. <laughs> but we, we get to use them all. And we get to use a lot of different hardware. Um, our, we work a lot with Tolga, because he has a lot of customers, uh, period, and, and some of his customers are also our customers. And, uh, 
just by virtue of that and with their 40 systems on the ground, you get to see everything, you know, um, every, every vendor, uh, you get to understand their service experience associated with each one too, the reliability of some of the equipment. We, it's not something we could opine on because we have a small subset of all systems, but certainly um, have an opinion about those things. Okay, so how are we doing, Eric? We got everybody in? I think we have all the questions answered. Yeah. Okay. Um, Lloyd, is there something else you'd want to tell us as somebody who's been doing this for a while, something you haven't hit yeah. yet? Well, um, you know, I find it, I'll tell you, I, you know, this is, this is my hobby. Um, this has been my hobby since um, I tried to shoot DSLR film on my age, that's eight inch SCT, and I just knew I could do it, and I just didn't. Um, but it's my hobby turned, you know, kind of small business enterprise. We have, you know, three, four employees that do bookkeeping and that sort of thing. Um, you know, by day, I'm a consultant in the healthcare industry. I just happen to, um, you know, be, I'm a business strategist, so this fits for me. So that's why we kind of look at everything a little bit differently. You know, uh, we had ideas of the sharing economy in our head when we were first thinking about this. Um, the, the expense and the difficulty uh, make you start to think about, of it a little bit differently if you didn't have any other exposure to the industry like we didn't. Okay. Well, right. I want to thank you for all thank the you. stuff you shared with us, not only about um, your operations out there in New Mexico and how you do it, but all the stuff you seem to know about, um, you know, what makes a better remote observatory and, um, you know, what it, it reminded me that I, I'm currently trying to finish up my little portrait gallery of Messier objects and I've been satisfied and I know that I'm shortchanging them with five minute exposures and stuff like <laughs> that. And it's time to move back up to the 10 and 15 minutes, which, uh, you know, I used to be doing. I just wanted to get out of the yeah. All these Messier objects, I wanted to get their little portraits. You know, when I, when I image in my backyard, you know, it'd be like, oh, the clouds are not going to be here for 15 minutes. I can get something done. And I'm hurrying and I'm rushing and you're nervous and you're trying to get things done. It's frustrating. You're freezing. Now, you know, if it's clear, we shoot. And if I, on my own personal system, I'm just going to sit it on that target and just lay on it, you know, for the next three weeks. Yeah, I'm not going to sweat it, you know, because we don't have to, you can kind of calm down and shoot the integrations that you're meant to shoot, I think. And, um, and that's what I do on my backyard observatory. I've got an observatory yeah. in the backyard here and I got one out in the desert, yeah. but I don't get to the desert every so often. <laughs> that's what I'm taking my LRGB Messier. Yeah. Collection, you know, so it's like yeah. try to get at least one a night. And and on the other hand, there are people that'll take. Well, I got only got four Messier objects to get tonight. <laughs> get an object in one, you know, four objects. Yeah. In one. Anyway, yeah, I, 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 I appreciate your having me. Um, glad to talk to anyone offline about it. I could go on for days. Are you going to be at AIC? And um, I doubt it. No, I doubt it. I'm actually. Uh, I'll be starting a, a new role here pretty soon, so I'll be pretty much heads down. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Are we ready to check out? Yeah, uh, Lloyd, uh, hang out after we uh, end the show. We have okay. a All right, we'll do. Thanks, uh, everyone. I want to remind everybody that uh, we are the Astro Imaging Channel. And by we, I mean you, me, Lloyd tonight, and in the past and in the future, I'm sure. Um, and Josh is joining us back after a couple of years' absence and stuff like that. Molly's here. Hi, Molly. And uh, but there's a whole lot more people out there that could be contributing to this. Uh, you all do astro imaging. You've all got something to share with other people. You can all get in on a phone call and stare into your little camera on your laptop, like I'm doing right now, and talk. I mean, that's all we're looking for. Um, there's 50 people maybe watching you right now if you're going live, and there, there'll be a thousand people over the course of the next week or two. Um, but don't let that get you nervous. You're just sitting in your living room talking on the phone, except it's not a phone, it's a webcam, you know? So just, you've got some stuff you can share. Come to us, visit with us. Um, and Olga, take us out. All right, good night, everybody. And we'll see you next week with uh, Nina.